Alrighty. Let's see if this is any better, guys. Let me turn this on. I'm just sending some things here. Oh my god, no, it is not better. It might even be worse. I think we're having a... Oof. Ay, ay, ay. I don't know if we're going to be able to stream today, guys. This is pretty bad. My upload speed is awful. Everything else is fine, but my upload speed is not good right now. I'm not sure what's happening. I might have to reset the entire router. Let's see. Let's see if it calms down. It's coming down. It's getting better. It's getting better pretty quickly. Let's see. Hopefully it sticks. Anyway, you guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for the patience. Uh, sorry, we haven't had a a failure like this in a while. So I'll wait for everybody to kind of get back in here. Um, let me get the uh, chat back up. It's loading up. Um, so this is way good early <laughs> that's awesome okay good 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 yeah i mean it's still lagging pretty bad but it is getting it's way better than it was um so yeah anyway share the show guys if you can tell everybody share the uh the new link if you can i'm gonna go ahead and tweet it out right now as well again apologies Sorry, I can't control the internet. <laughs> uh, all right, let's do this. Alrighty. Okay, so where the hell was I? <laughs> okay. Um, let's start here. Here we go. All right. So the history of the all domain anomaly resolution office, excuse me, Kona, Kona Blue. The history and origin of Kona Blue. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start from the top here. And again, this is probably the only thing that you really should look at. And just in case, uh, you know, just for for shits and giggles, let's um, let's just go back to those UFO pictures real quick, <laughs> just in case you guys missed those, because <laughs> um, these were great, you know. Like I'll show a couple more. Like check this one out. This one's pretty cool. A little blurry, I think, obviously, because it's in the background and the trees are in the foreground. Uh, but where's the, there was one pretty good one here. Let me see. Yeah, there it is. Look at that thing. <laughs> like, why don't we get UFO pictures like this nowadays, huh? Why do we not get UFO pictures like this anymore? Um, we need, we need more like that. Uh, anyway. Uh, okay, let's get back to this. Okay, so the Aero Office first learned of Kona Blue program from interviews conducted as part of the historical review. Multiple interviewees identified Kona Blue as a Department of Homeland Security sensitive compartment established to protect the retrieval and exploitation of, quote, non-human biologics. Kind of sounds familiar. I wonder where they got this from. Arrow researched the information provided the interviewees provided by the interviewees and learned Kona Blue was a prospective special access program that had been proposed to the Department of Homeland Security leadership, but was never approved or formally established. Kona Blue never received any materials or funding, and there is no information beyond the proposal present presentation marked with the Kona Blue name. 
Arrow traced the origin of the proposal for Kona Blue to the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program, as we all know, ASAP slash ATIP. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, oh, this is the proof that ATIP existed. I don't think it is. I think this is the all domain, the Arrow office putting it in writing so that way there's no confusion whether i i think they honestly they probably they think of osap and atip as the same thing because a lot of people think of osap into atip as the same thing even though they were not at all um osap was funded with 22 million dollars atip never was funded by anyone ever um honestly i think they're putting this in here so that way it's it's in there <laughs> it's there's no confusing it okay um because you you've got all sides of this osap and atip completely conflicting in public about their involvement and which one was more official than the other um and yeah through stephen green street's work and 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 greenwald we've learned that atip as far as as far as we could tell through foia and as far as we could tell through, there's never been any sort of communication between anyone about ATIP. There's nothing. This is just a hobby by Lou Elizondo that he piggybacked onto OSAP. Ah, okay. So the program, which was managed by the Defense Intelligence Agency from 2009 to 2012 and funded through congressional earmarks, Bigelow Aerospace, headquartered in Nevada, served as the primary contractor executing funds for the program and delivered multiple reports during the period of their contract. DIA terminated the program due to a cited lack of merit and lack of utility in the products Bigelow produced for the DIA's mission. In other words, like we've said before, and this doesn't go for every single person on that. Um, thank you for the subscription, Thomas Souls. Appreciate it. Um, I think that goes for everyone. Uh, or it doesn't go for everyone who worked on that ranch, but there were a lot of people who worked on that ranch that got drunk every night that made up reports. They made up reports to keep the contract going. They're like, Oh shit, we got $22 million to study ghosts and goblins. Well, let's give them ghosts and goblins. They, that way they can say, okay, here's another $40 million or 60 million. Cause usually when you get a renewed contract, you get even more money. Um, and, uh, they were literally making things up. And so the, 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 the DIA terminated the program due to a cited lack of merit and a lack of utility in the products Bigelow produced for the DIA's mission. So they couldn't produce any scientific evidence whatsoever. Nothing. Just a bunch of made up stories. So when DIA canceled OSAP slash ATIP, several individuals involved with that program advocated for the Department of Homeland Security to take the effort over and fund a new version of OSAP slash ATIP under the code name Kona Blue. So going back to sort of how this was described, UFO Joe basically said, Kona Blue is, or could have been OSAP on steroids. They wanted to go bigger and better. And that's what they've done since 2017. They've changed the name of this thing every single time to, in hopes that nobody catches on. Like, the, okay, guys, it's the same program. We get it. It's the same thing. Okay, you guys are advocating for all the same stuff that the old guys were advocating. The old guys, which are really the same guys. <laughs> um, according to the proposal, Kona Blue would continue the work previously undertaken by the DIA's OSAP ATIP to investigate, identify, and analyze sensitive materials and technologies to include advanced aerospace vehicles. 
in 2011, the DHS Undersecretary for Science and Technology established by Kona Blue as a PSAP based on claims that relevant information and material existed and required this level of protection. The Undersecretary uh, also cited congressional interest in the subject and possible impacts on Homeland Security as part of the justification for the program. Six months later, however, the deputy secretary of DHS disapproved Kona Blue as a special access program. So they got denied. They got denied based off of the past work of OSAP and the results that they got there and the waste of money that it was there. Thank God that the deputy, deputy secretary at the DHS disapproved it because that would have been... $22 million would have looked like a drop in the bucket if you go over the proposal, this 56-page proposal of what they want to do. Captain J, thank you for becoming a member, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so damn much. Um, appreciate all the love, guys. Uh, and again, thank you for coming to the new stream. I appreciate it. I know that's a pain in the ass. Um... So, okay, so do, 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 and further directed its immediate termination, citing concerns about the ac adequacy of justification for the program and sufficiency of information central to the proposal development, including personnel and budget requirements. It is critical to note that while some DHS personnel believe that relevant information and material would be delivered to DHS upon establishment of the SAP, no data or material of any any kind was ever transferred to or collected by DHS under the auspices of Kona Blue. Information associated with the activities conducted under the auspices of OSAP and ATIP remains within DIA archived holdings. This archived PSAP proposal and associated documents have been declassified in a partnership between the DOD and the Department of Homeland Security and are being released to the public in accordance with both agencies' commitment to transparency. Other than a single instance of attorney-client material redacted by 38 pages of DHS, all redactions were made by the Department of Defense. So there's 38 pages that... Uh, other than a single instance of attorney client material redacted from page 38 by DHS, all redactions were made by the Department of Defense. So, um, yeah, just one page, page 38 was they had to redact something there, um, probably somebody's actual name or something. So. Let me see here again, this is the 56 page project description, advanced technology, through all of these things that basically are implying that aliens are visiting and they want money to look at it. That's what this 56 page thing did. And then the Department of Homeland Security looked at it and said, huh, that kind of sounds like bullshit. And it also sounds like that old program, OSAP or ATIP, whatever the fuck you guys call it, because um, you guys can't even get your story straight on that. Um, yeah, we, we're not going to waste taxpayer dollars on looking at this anymore. And this is basically everything that you guys have asked for. The believers... It, it, okay. So what is the Aero Office supposed to do with this? In my opinion, they did the right thing by releasing it because that shows, okay, look, yes, there was a program called Kona Blue, but it was a proposed program that never got any money, any funding, nothing was ever made, no office was ever built. There wasn't even a fucking phone number created for this. It, it was like literally a fart in the wind. But... And if they hide this, if they say, ah, oh, we can't reveal this because this is embarrassing or there's aspects of it that we don't want to declassify, then somebody catches wind like a Linda Moulton Howe, okay, gets like maybe four or five pages from this and confirms that Kona Blue is a real thing and that the Department of Defense is hiding it and that they're being secretive, they're not being honest, da 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 da, da. I mean, just the conspiracy theories that can be woven by just a few pages out of this 56-page document. 
would have been incredible. Joe Mergia would have been screaming at the top of the lungs. Oh my God, there's a program that exists. It's called Kona Blue. It's bigger than OSAP. They're looking at UFOs. Oh my, he would have gone on and on and on and on and on like he does with the Wilson Davis notes and like he does with all of the garbage that he regurgitates from Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. This is an effort to tell the American people, but more specifically, the conspiracy theorists, here you go. Here's the co here's everything we have on Kona Blue. We're not hiding anything but one name on page 38. <laughs> have at it. But just so you guys know, none of this shit ever existed. It never came to fruition because the previous version of it, all sap, the things that you guys just love to eat up was bullshit and it was a waste of money. So we're not touching Kona blue with a 10 foot pole. That's what this is. Um, and of course, everyone's going to, you know, add their own meaning to it. Um, you know, the, 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 the believers are like, I love how they turn obvious losses against their belief. Like just, just information data that, that crumbles the infrastructure that is their belief system. And they still find a way to patch it up and put it right back to what it was like every almost every single time i don't understand how you guys can keep believing and keep falling for the lies the manipulation the grifting that george knapp jeremy corbell have spun on Skinwalker Ranch. And that goes for Bigelow. That goes for uh, the new guys that are there in Brandon Fugel and the way that these guys are telling people that the Skinwalker uh, uh, um, does attach to people, gives people cancer. It's killed people in some cases. It swelled up the head of people who work there. Um, and they all agree that it's transmissible. Yet, they will have a UFO con where they're giving people hugs, high fiving them, taking pictures. Like if you're so scared that this is a transferable entity that preys on kids, why the fuck are you going to a UFO con and shaking hands with people? It's it's a joke. It's a werewolves in trench coats, smoking cigarettes, dino beavers, portals where people see dinosaurs on the other side of it. Like the kookiest, dumbest shit that you could possibly think of has come out of Skinwalker Ranch. And people like UFO just eat it up. Mm, mm, delicious. Oh, it's so good. I just love eating this bullshit. Linda Moulton Howe, yummy, yummy, yummy. Let me write 15,000 blogs about this spooky ranch. And I wanna be the expert when it comes to any time a cattle gets mutilated on this ranch. When you look at the lore and the, the, the lore of this ranch and you really go back to the first owners, uh, and when I say first owners, I don't mean the Native Americans. I mean, I mean the people who settled there after the Native Americans none of these spooky things were happening until a certain, I can't remember the name of the family took over that ranch. And then that's when all the spooky stuff happened. Then Bigelow bought it. And then even spookier stuff started happening because they were making up stories and getting wasted on the ranch to continue this, this, this charade, this government waste. And who do you think took, took advantage of that the most? It wasn't the guys getting drunk on the ranch. They were getting paid, but not like Bigelow probably made out on that deal. He bought that ranch for little to nothing, turned around and sold it for a very hefty profit. And now they're turning that ranch into a paranormal Disneyland for, for, for I'm sorry, stupid adults. <laughs> like, that's what this is.
That's what it is. That's why they copyrighted the name Skinwalker. That's why it's an entertainment company, not a science and and uh, exploration company. It is bullshit. And it all, honestly, it, it like, it all connects to this Kona Blue stuff. All of this stuff, it's all the same thing, just repackaged under something else. And that's what they're doing today. They're taking all of this stuff and they're repackaging it to lawmakers. And instead of this time, let us look at the spooky stuff. It's, hey, let us look at this section of the sky that we know you don't have your instruments dialed into. As if they can do a better job at looking at that part of the sky than the United States military. Let us help you raise safety and awareness. Why? They don't need your help doing that. They can communicate all of those things, not only to the different branches of the military, but also to the FAA and governing bodies that that look that already are in place to look over flight safety and talk about drone issues and talk about balloons and talk about things that could get lodged in an engine while you're in flight. <laughs> like those are all very real concerns that the, the people who need to know, know about it. What's not going on is that there's no other next step of, well, um, these could be aliens. So just prepare yourself for that. Nobody, nobody is telling the pilots that. Uh, but what they are asking of them is like, please report it, please report it. And if you're in the military, you're by law required to report it, especially if you interact with the UAP, you have to report it within 11 hours, <laughs> 11 hours. So, um, yeah, it, it's. That was just a very interesting day. Very interesting dump here by the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. I like that they're doing stuff like this. Again, I think it dispels it dispels um, conspiracy theories. When you have stuff like this, it immediately takes the whole mystery out of Kona Blue. So now, anytime somebody references Kona Blue as some real project, and they will, somebody like Richard Doty will talk about the 27 different alien species that are really connected to the real Kona Blue that nobody knows about except for him. You know, like you can immediately send this link to them and be like, yeah, nope, that's all bullshit. So it's helpful. It's incredibly helpful. Um, okay, let's see here. What else do we want to talk about? Man, that uh, it always takes longer than what I... Uh... <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. Um, yeah, that's funny. Ashton Forbes, man. I mean, I don't know how many losses he's going to take on this, but it's just every day. Mick West put this out. It's such a great point. When a camera shakes top left, okay, the real footage of an airplane leaving um, uh, trails behind it, everything in the scene should move the same amount. If, like in the MH370 hoax, bottom left, contrails don't shake the same as the plane, then you know it's a fake video. And he's 100% correct. Like, he's 100% correct on this. The, fl the, the contrails are shaking when the plane is not. Here, the image shakes as one because it's a real image. It's, I, I, I honestly, I do not know how this stuff gets to the point that it gets to it's 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 wild how how much influence that guy has it's 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 shocking shocking how quickly uh that guy uh grew <laughs> like in ego and and bad information and conspiracy thinking um, and how, how many people he inspires to think like that and how many people he, he puts in a very, very deep rabbit hole that if they go down that one, ooh, good luck getting them out. Good luck getting them out of an MH370 rabbit hole. Um, you probably lost them forever because there is no reasoning with those guys. Zero. Zero reasoning. Um, so, 
Ay, ay, ay. All right. Um, let's talk about the the lawmakers. This is funny. I don't know who put that out. Um, yeah, I, don't, I wasn't going to talk about that. Let's go to Ask a Poll here. Uh, which, by the way, I've got the link for this in the description. Uh, this is Matt Laszlo, and he's getting... There was a skiff meeting it yesterday in Washington, D.C. And um, so we, of course, got the usual suspects and a, and, a, and a couple of other lawmakers that normally we don't hear from on this. Um, this one is the one that stuck out to me, and I think a lot of people sort of pointed out and go, yep. We told you so. Um, and Eric Burleson, again, with his as as fanatical as he is with his religion, he still comes across to me as someone who is trying to look at things logically. I know that's mm, he's to me out of the people that are coming out of these meetings. He's the most logical of them. That's what, how I'll put it. <laughs> that, I don't know if that's saying much because we're talking about Burchett and Luna uh, and um, Moscovich, who all of these lawmakers are literally bottom of the barrel, uh, don't get anything done for their district kind of lawmakers. And so um, Eric Burleson here, out of them, to me, seems like the most intelligent. But again, these clips, I included the link uh, to these in the description below so please go give matt lazlo some love if you could support him please do uh but yeah this is uh, uh representative eric burleson coming out of this skiff meeting uh and let me also put the volume on this let me just make sure you guys are hearing this okay that's really low I'm going to bump this up for you guys some more. Give me a second. Sorry. Your skepticism. Yeah. My skepticism is probably more validated. I, mm. I went into the hearing wanting to confirm, you know, the, to the extent of which they investigated, how far did they go? Did they, uh, and, I, and I feel uh, we got some good answers. Right, I'm going to play that again for you guys. Just give me a second here. Um, let's see, I want to do three, three dB. Let's see if that works. Again, my worldview has been very skeptical that this is extraterrestrial. And I, okay, so my worldview is that I've been very skeptical that this is extraterrestrial. I'm going to bump it up even more here. Sorry, all of my settings seem to be out of whack today, guys. So. Thank you for being patient. I've been that remains that this is extraterrestrial, and I've been that remains. Uh, I, there's nothing that I learned today that, in fact, probably have more validated today. I, uh, my world is probably more validated. So, so his skepticism. His skepticism has been more validated after the skiff meeting. So, in other words, the information that he's getting, he's going, oh, okay, I think I'm starting to get it. The things people are seeing are confusing this stuff with our tech. Okay. I understand now. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you can see like, I, 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 I don't know if he looks deflated because he knows the backlash that he's about to get for saying this. Um, and I know he's caught a lot of shit online for saying this. Um, and you know, the believers are like, Oh, he's losing faith. They're saying things to them in the skiff. That's making them, you know, do one eighties. Uh, they're, they're threatening them. They're intimidating them. And it's just like, none of these things are true. None of these things are true. And, and he's, you know, he's been pretty damn clear, uh, that, you know, he's going to follow the information where it goes. Um, so I got to appreciate that from Eric Burleson. Oopsie. My worldview has been very skeptical that this is extraterrestrial. And that hasn't been his worldview totally. I mean, that's, he said things, but he's also, you know, compared these things to angels and demons, <laughs> you know? So, so yes and no, uh, Congressman. And, I, and that remains, uh, I, there's nothing that I learned today that, in 
fact, probably have more validated today. I, uh, my worldview is probably more validated. Yeah. Your skepticism. Yeah, my skepticism is probably more validated. I, I went into the hearing wanting to confirm, you know, the, to the extent of which they investigated, how far do they go? Do they? Uh, and I and I feel uh, we got some good answers. So he's getting good answers. He's he's he feels like he's being told the truth and he's starting to understand the bigger picture, I think. Um, and then, you know, juxtapose that to here. We've got um, Representative Luna and Burchett. And boy, man, some of the conversations that Luna's having in the background are kind of funny, but not really. Um, but let's listen to this one. Back to your office? <laughs> or look. Back to my office. See? I told you I was gonna beat him up there. <laughs> <laughs> and he's high tail and he's like, get me out of here. <laughs> nothing. Ask her. It was literally, there was, it was a nothing burger. Really? A nothing burger. It's not how you guys, what's the next step? There's no reason any of that stuff was told in this kid. Yeah. Other than just not talk about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Burchett's like, there's no reason why any of that stuff was told in a skiff. Okay, I cannot, I don't understand why Representative Luna and Burchett can't get this through their thick fucking skulls. You guys do not sit on any committees, subcommittees, that would give you access to the top classified information. And neither did Eric Burleson, and he's coming out of there going, yeah, my skepticism was more validated about this stuff. Didn't think it was aliens to begin with, and now I really don't. Because he's, he's, he's clearly got a brain in between those two ears. Unlike the two of you guys they are literally doing these skiff meetings just to shut you up. And also hopefully get through the lawmakers that will actually listen, digest, analyze the situation, and then come to a conclusion just like Burleson did. And that conclusion is, Oh shit, we've got a big drone problem. Oh shit, the things that pilots are seeing are being confused with our tech. And there's a multitude of other things that are also contributing to these misidentifications. But Luna and Burchett just can't get that through their thick fucking skulls. They just can't. They're like, oh, it's a nothing burger. I don't even understand why the information in there is not it is in a skiff because they can't trust you idiots to show you anything. And I get that. Like, I understand. I'm not good at keeping secrets either. <laughs> like, it's not really my bag, man. I get it. But that's why you're not on those committees, too, among, among other reasons as well. And. You don't see Gillibrand going into this skiff meeting. You don't see Rubio coming out of this skiff meeting because they they got better information than this, and they know for sure that it's a drone problem because they've said that it's a national security issue because they've said that they they have released so much information. In regards to, and more information is coming. God, the Aero Office has released more data than any any whistleblower. That's just a fact. It's just facts. And I cannot wait until they release the paper um, uh, discussing the gimbal. The, the the scientific peer-reviewed paper that NASA is going to look at, the Aero Office is going to look at, a whole bunch of different PhDs that actually look at these things are going to look at, write a paper, come to a conclusion, and then present that conclusion, not only to lawmakers, but to the American people. Just, it's a nothing burger. 
Have any of you been able to look at that cone of blue declassified? Mm. I just saw it just today. I haven't looked at it. Yeah. I have to check it out. <laughs> and I like Matt. I like that. I, I think Matt really is more of a um, political reporter. I think he has a very surface level knowledge of UFOs. And so some of these UFO questions that he asks, none of them rarely get a great answer or cut to the bone of what's happening. Um, I would love to see like, Hey, if you guys heard of the Kona blue, did, do you, did you hear that? That was like just a proposed program, very similar to OSAP in that it got disapproved because they saw that it was a waste of money, just like the OSAP program. Did you guys, did you guys hear about that? Are you guys worried that you're being led astray on bad information to get you to publicly talk about UFOs so people can lobby the government to get money to look at it just like OSAP or this proposed Kona Blue program? We could ask questions like that. <laughs> you know, Steve Long says, per Chet Luna, if they're not showing us the dang gung aliens, they're hiding, <laughs> then they're lying. <laughs> Oh, man. Hey, Martin Willis is here. Yeah, I haven't seen Martin in a while. Hey, Martin. <sighs> Martin, I hope you're not mad at me. Uh, I'm not to tolerate a fraud by you. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the fake, are, are you talking about the fake Lou Elizondo? Just because he's funny. He's trying to sell his book. I don't think he means like harm. If we're talking about the fake Elizondo, please don't kick out the fake Elizondo art. And I, I do enjoy his company. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so let's let's listen to the rest of what Luna and Pritchett have to say. like Arrow's delivering on their congressional mandate? Yeah. yeah. What did I think Luna said? Yeah. I think they showed up. Yeah. Okay. So again, like, yeah, she's just very. I mean, you guys funded them, started them two years ago before some of y'all were here. You guys ultimately are their bosses. It was tucked into a nothing bill. Again, like this bill was made. And advocated by your buddies, Christopher Mellon, Lou Elizondo, uh, Sean Cahill. Um, this bill was was proposed and written into law by Senator Gillibrand and Marco Rubio. This is what you guys wanted. All of these protections that have been put in place by that law. So whistleblowers can come forward and tell their stories, which led to the release of the Kona Blue stuff. Like, this is what you wanted. And now you're bitching and complaining about it. Because it's not getting the answers that you thought were going to be there. That's not how this works. Yeah. What do you make of their senior technical advisory board? I don't like think anything of anything. Yeah. Because it's just... I just don't get a lot of information. I mean, over in the set. I mean, it's true. Fake Lou is more believable than the real Lou. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes. Okay, come on. Come on, fake Lou. Leave Martin alone. He's a buddy. Um,. Thanks, guys. I'm always being attacked by the naysayers. Wise monkey Lou uh, doesn't want him removed. I don't. I think he's hilarious. I mean, unless he's saying like, like racist stuff or something, you know, which I don't think he's doing. He's usually just selling and plugging his book for $19.99 at all fine retailers. I mean, if it's in that vein, yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind. Don't mind at all. Senate side now, we're getting a ton of complaints about incursions over U.S military bases and nuclear sites yep we're not getting anything yeah i'm sorry what'd you make of their report though again i 
Because they, they think that's definitive. Yeah, he's not giving you anything. Once again, I just feel like the whole thing is just because of I think it's open part that we're not going to get information. And we're told in this gift. I mean, you hear Birch, I, I like, yeah, he's just saying the same thing over and over, but you hear Lewin in the background going, oh my God, they're going to be giving $9 billion to Gaza. Oh my God. Man. Stuff that shouldn't be classified, it is. Do you feel like part of it's they don't know? Yeah, I mean, that's what the compartmentalization aspect is. So that makes them useless. I mean, it's federal. The compart like, uh, then he throws compart. It's because of the comp compartmentalization. No, it's because you don't have access. You don't have the classification to look at this stuff, lawmaker. You don't. There are other lawmakers on other committees that do. And they are not saying the same things you are. Nowhere near the same things you are. And that Luna are. The more... The, the more powerful lawmakers, the senators, not the congressmen, the senators. Federal government, in a nutshell. Yeah. But now how do you guys, so for the next public? We gotta have a president that just says, release it all. Yeah, and that's the only way it's gonna happen. We are talking to Grothman earlier, he said, he's still expecting another hearing this year, public one. Yeah. What do you think that'll look like? So there's another hearing, which is cool. So, um, you know, that'll be public. So at least we'll get to listen to the questions in that one. I hope it's from the scientific community. Yeah. That's he not. hopes it's with the scientific community. Are you sure about that? Be careful what you ask for there, Tim. Be careful. That's what I'm shooting for. Is it for Patrick Mountain, your constituent? <laughs> no, it's Oak Ridge. It's flash. Yeah, a little for that. What do you think you can, what are your questions for the scientific community? <laughs> I don't know yet. I'm going to wait. What are your questions for the scientific community? I don't know yet. So the, I mean, you don't have one question? That was the first thing you wanted to see at the hearing and you don't have one question for the scientific community? I mean, you do realize that Dr. Kirkpatrick is a scientist, right? And that the Aero Office is made up of scientists, right? And also intelligence community guys. And also they're being their work's being double checked by NASA. More scientists. But you don't have a question. You don't have one question ready to go for the scientists. All right. All right. I'm first. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm sorry. No, I've seen that on buffering, guys. But yeah, there's just there's nothing I can do. It's kind of out of my control, unfortunately. Um you know, hopefully the audio is not being affected too badly by it. Um, but yeah, the internet's just been all wonky in our building today. So I apologize. Um, it's a lot better than it was when we started to show, but yeah, it seems like it's, we're dropping 28% of our frames, which is not great. So audio is okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Arden. Um, yeah, unfortunately guys, it just, it's going to be one of those audio shows today, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, let me play the rest of this. Because they have, uh, obviously they're on a different level than any of these folks are. Yeah. Hey, did you see that? Yeah, there's really nothing else said in this. Okay. And let me see here. Senior defense appropriate. Okay. So this is, uh, Senator John Boozman. You guys in charge of funding Arrow? Listen to this. Okay, so this is a senator uh, on the Defense Appropriations Committee. Okay. Now, this is actually a pretty good question, and I can't believe he doesn't know. You're defense Appropriations, right? Yeah. You guys in charge of funding Arrow? the all-domain anomaly office or whatever, the UFO stuff. 
I don't know. I, to be honest, I'm not. It doesn't come up as a line item. It probably just falls within the broader Pentagon budget. I'm not. To be honest, I don't know. Interesting. Have you followed at all the investigation on that over in the House? It sure hasn't. Uh, no, I, I really haven't. Yeah. If you'll, uh, you know, if you want background, ping the office. Ping the office and just. Yep. One of my guys will know. Cool. Yes, for, Tell him you sent me. That's for Pat. For Pat. Tell him you uh, Yes, sir. Biden. Appreciate you. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, you figured he should know. He should know who's funding the office. And that's a good question. Where exactly is that money coming from? Um, and who is holding the Aero office accountable? That's a good question. That's a question I want the answer to. Uh, okay, so yeah, that was... Um, you're asking here a question crystal clear. Uh, you are asking who was that speaking. In the last clip that we played, that was... Um, Senate Defense Appropriate uh, Appropriations Committee member Senator John Boozman. Let's see, let's see what state Boozman is in. He's a Republican from the state of Arizona. So, yeah, there you go. Um, okay, here's Jared Moskovitz. Uh, has questions for the air on David Grush's clearance. Okay, so check this one out. How you doing, sir? What's going on? How you doing? Living the dream. Living the dream? Hey, did you... Good night, <laughs> Right? Did you, um... You hear about the aero briefing next week? Yeah, I'm going. What do you, uh, hope to get out of that? Well, first of all, I'm glad they're doing it. Yeah. I think that's important. Um, look, I think I'm going to have a lot of questions on... UAPs, that's what they're in charge of. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about some of Grush's accusations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, also, so this is basically, this is from the 11th. So this is him asking about this SCIF meeting that's coming up. And I thought he had something to say, but I guess uh, Laszlo didn't get a quote from him. But I thought I did see him. Uh, here's, okay, yeah, here is... Okay, so this clip is wild right here. Um, check this one out. Or in you, Mr. Whitman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Secretary Ken, I'd like to begin with you. The U.S. Air Force base budget and then the UCOM unfunded requirements list both call for additional counter small UAS capability at U.S. Air Force installations. As I see things unfolding, we see counter small UAS and really loitering munitions not having much distinction. They are becoming the same thing. We saw recently a very disturbing trend at Langley Air Force Base where because of a large number of UASs that were in that airspace, Langley had to close down just to make sure that we were able to defend the operations that were going on there. Uh, as I watch how missions are developing, you see the Army Missile Defense Mission, you see the Air Force Air Base Air Defense Mission, uh, and it looks like to me that there's a lot of commonalities there. Uh, can, can you give me an idea about uh, how do you look at those different requirements and who's responsible for what mission? Is, are there clear lines of distinction there? And uh, do you think that based upon where we are today, are our Air Force bases adequately protected? Um, we have a wide range of threats to our air bases. Uh, they vary by theater quite a bit. Uh, different in the Middle East or in Europe or in the Pacific. Um, in the Pacific in particular, what China has been acquiring is a variety of missiles, precision missiles, ballistic and cruise and hypersonic designed to attack our air bases. And that's the threat that really drives us more than anything else right now. Uh, in, in the Middle East and to some extent in Europe, we're faced with small UAVs more. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to deal with all of these. The, the way the department is approaching this is that um, the Army is generally the lead for research and development on small UAV problem, and we're participating in that. We contribute to that and our full-fledged full, full, full -fledged members. And we are funding some uh, improvements to our air bases for security that. I was just at several of our Middle East air bases where we have systems deployed today because of that threat. Um, so a lot of people have also been asking, people have been asking, well, you know, um, you know, Lou, uh, how can we not be prepared? How can we not be prepared? Here you are saying in one hand that 
you know, these drones are crazy advanced and our drones are crazy advanced, but yet our military bases are not prepared for these, but our military bases overseas are. Again, this is something new for the United States to have foreign enemies in our airspace over the continental United States. That is something new for the United States other than satellite and high plane imaging. And I don't even know if, if the high plane imaging is happening these days. Satellites, probably, most definitely. Um, but I don't think China's flying planes over our airspace. Just like, uh, maybe we are flying our stuff over China's airspace. I mean, you know, I don't know. War games, man. I don't know the answers to these things, but I think like, you're running a risk if you do, because if you get caught, you could start a war. You could start a war. Uh, Greg O'Brien, thank you for the $10 super chat, man. Appreciate it. What comes before sperm and what comes even before that? So on and so forth. What the F are we? I digress. <laughs> Great question. Well, that's, those are, that's pretty deep, man. That's pretty deep. Um... <laughs> Uh, Michael Huntington, the DOD want to establish firm all domain aerospace command and control JADC2 as we enter the drone age total sky surveillance totality. I agree. I agree. And I think, yeah, that's what these laws are opening the door for. You know, they're opening the door. I mean, I know that they don't like commercial drones. <laughs> that's just nothing but a headache for them. I know they don't like, um, you know, yeah, I mean, forget about drug running drones. Like there's so many other things like commercial balloons, you know, things like, um, you know, air uh, weather balloons, unsanctioned and sanctioned weather balloons. Um, but yeah, I mean, drones and balloons are such an issue, man. They're, they become, again, they shut down Langley Air Force Base. And that kind of goes kind of goes on to what we're going to talk about here. Um, we'll play this interview with Ross Colthart, and this is with a interview with this gentleman by the name of Jonathan Butner. He, and that's what he's calling himself. This guy is clearly a veteran. Um, and he took some video of Langley getting hit or sw swarmed by what looks like drones. Um, they've got, FAA like flashing lights on them. Um, but what this footage, I don't know if we're going to play the whole, the whole thing. I mean, we've got some time, but the whole, the whole story, how it evolves into, he thinks it's something otherworldly, way more advanced than what humans can make. Um, it's kind of wild to just sit here and listen to him. Uh, sort of get into that um hey can you you know what this one right here hmm hey arden if you see anybody advertising their show Block them. <laughs> I don't want people advertising their show in my feed. Well, that is the lamest shit you could do. So we have a late breaking development on this reality check story. The man... By the way, this is not a late breaking development. Um, <laughs> it's literally an edited show. Um, this was oh, definitely a planned part of the show. So we have a late breaking development on this reality check story. The man who shot the videos, Jonathan Butner, has agreed to speak audio only to Reality Check. Audio only. He was only. across the water from Langley Air Force Base on the evening in question. On in um, By the way, fair use. Fair use. We're educating the public and critiquing the videos that we are watching and sharing. This is covered under fair use and allowed by, by law. I also have a link to this full... Um, interview he's also got ryan graves that comes on here a little bit later um so yeah if you want to see the whole interview link is in the description 
in December. And he's now willing to give us his account of what he saw. And the fascinating thing is, he's pretty sure what he saw was indeed anomalous, not some kind of commercial drone, helicopter or other aircraft. Good evening, Jonathan Butner. Hello, Russ. So, Jonathan, tell me what you saw in December last year. I, I understand we won't say exactly where, but you... Okay, and also just to, just to clarify that this was the same... I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the Langley that Rep. Rob Whitman is speaking about here is the same footage that this gentleman captured on that day i think this is they're referencing this incident um and it's also an incident that tyler rogaway at the war zone wrote about so this video is sort of the corroborating evidence to verify that the things that were happening at langley were true and there were over 40 drones apparently uh that were swarming the base they had to shut down the air traffic over the base because of this um, and I, as far as I know, none of those drones were collected. Um, and according to this gentleman, there was not only 40 drones, but yeah, a mothership. Uh, so we'll, we'll get there. You were in a premises in a residence that was across the water from Langley Air Force Base. Tell me where you were roughly and what you started seeing. Uh, yes, sir. So yes, I was, uh, so he says yes sir a lot um i believe this guy is retired military and i also believe and you'll listen to why i believe this he's a fan of ross colthart he knows who he is he's a fan of lou elizondo he's a he knows all of these guys um so i think take this with a grain of salt uh, I don't know who Jonathan Butner is. Again, he's not showing his face. He's just giving this eyewitness testimony along with this video. He's been interviewed by the FBI. So that's significant. Uh, but that doesn't mean what he filmed is alien or, or advanced or NHI or anything that wasn't made by human hands. At a residence up on the southern side of the James River at about 7 p.m. on uh, Thursday, December 14th. Uh, the sun was just going down for the evening, and it was supposed to be a meteor shower that night. So I was, I was there, you know, just planning on watching that. Uh, you know, directly across from me is Fort Eustace, Eustace then Newport News, and then Langley is uh, off in the, the distance as well. Uh, but I began to see, right after the sun went down, I began to see these reddish, orange, blinking lights that, that started coming from the okay, check these out. southeast of me, crossing the James River. Okay, um, let's began... also keep in mind, okay, because this story evolves as he keeps telling it. They're blinking. They're blinking. Since when do non-human intelligence, aliens, UFOs, since when do UFOs blink like airplanes? When did that start happening? Also keep in mind that none of these videos show any of the five observables, not one of them. Again, these are the standards that they set and none of these standards are met with this video or this uh, one eyewitness. Again, one, two, three at a, t at a time, kind of you know, almost in a conveyor belt fashion. Uh, they would go north of Langley Air Force Base uh, it was what it appeared to me, which was about, I would say, 11 or 12 miles away, and then head towards uh, the west, uh, past it. But then they would kind of slowly turn and then go straight back over uh, where the, I perceived the, where the base would be. Uh, it kind of confirmed to me that it was Langley when I would sometimes see a, a searchlight that would start flashing from the ground and kind of wave back and forth, uh, uh, never really focusing on any of them as they went past, but just kind of like just waving back and forth. Uh, the, the orbs 
um, I would say looked about car sized. I mean, just from that car size. He says they look car sized. He will also tell you he was about 10 miles away from these things. Distance. And they kept a very steady pace until they got over that location in which they would start hovering over over the base. Now, can I ask you this, sir? The official explanation at the moment is not really forthcoming, but the word drone has been used, i.e. to suggest that perhaps this is some kind of commercial or perhaps military uh -huh. drone of some kind. Right, yeah. Is what you saw that night consistent with what you would think of as a drone? <laughs> what kind of question is that? Like, I mean, like, can you please basically tell us that I mean, the official story is that these things are drones, but what do you think, guy? <laughs> Mystery guy? What do you think? Well, I think you know, a lot of people seem to think that a drone is like kind of what we're used to seeing, something that you could put in a backpack and control with a remote control. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these were large, and they seem orb-shaped. Right. Uh, like military drones or adversarial drones. Again, when you go back to Tyler Rogaways and if I'm not mistaken, Langley Air Force Base, I'm pretty sure is close to the ocean. Uh, let's take a look at where you're at there. Good old Langley Air Force Base. And there she is. Yep. Right there. And is that Richmond, Virginia? Yep. Opens up right to the Atlantic Ocean, everybody. <laughs> okay. In Tyler Rogaway's piece, and also keep in mind, this is Washington, D.C., Delaware, Baltimore, New York. Like, these are major shipping hubs. In the Tyler Rogaway article where he's discussing the drone issue... He there's a part of the article where he discusses um, Chinese ships that launch drone systems from cargo ships. And they do it incoming. And then when they're done surveilling whatever they're looking at, they fly to an outgoing ship. And these things are capable of launching off of a boat. They're capable of flying for over 24 hours, depending on the wind conditions. Some of these drones use the, the air currents to stay afloat or lofted in the air without using any power. They're designed to take advantage of the wind. They use power to get up there, but as soon as they're up there, they can, they can sit and depending on how long the wind lasts for a long time, you know? So when you get these reports of, oh, they just sat there for literally three days, those could be drones, easily be drones. Um, So just keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. Uh, I, you know, you, you could say the, the word drone, uh, you know, I, I have no ways of knowing if they were manned or not, but these were not not the drones with four blades on on the edges. Uh, okay. These were Can I ask you this? And that's fair. They're not like, you know, commercial four four prong drones that everybody's seen. It's not a Mavic, you know, two drone. It's not a DJI. It's none of those things. That I I think he's right. For sure. I believe that, especially if you're 10 miles away and they look as big as cars. That means that they're, they're probably maybe even a little bit bigger than cars. I mean, or the size of a Volkswagen Bug. Who knows, man? You go out and you start looking at commercially available drone systems, man, they get very high tech. And the things that you can attach to them are insane. I mean, you could buy them here. <laughs> Ask you this do you think you would have yeah. heard obviously you're over water which does tend to amplify noise if they water is not going to amplify that noise
that's no. If you got an, a, a, a massive body of water between you and something else, you just hear the muffling of the water moving in the wind. It masks sounds that are far away. But not according to Ross. That's There were the helicopter propellants, propellers. If, if this was like a conventional drone with helicopter propellers, would you have heard it, do you think? Um, it, you know, it was quite a distance. I would say it's probably over 10 miles. Over 10 miles. So if it was a fucking helicopter, he wouldn't have heard it. If it was a jet, maybe a jet, maybe he might have heard a jet. But he wouldn't have heard any propellered vehicle 10 miles away over a body of water. No, no. The, the ones that were going over the base. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, helicopters and I've seen a lot of planes from from that vantage point go and on I know what you know wings look like with the green light on one end and mm -hmm. red on the other or if it was a, a black hawk with a, a tail rotor and also uh, lights around there you know th these orbs were the lights and they would go directly from that reddish orange right to white it was not like a blinking on and off and they, it's it's literally we, blinking on confidence. and off in in this video before they would go back out at that southeasterly direction they came from, like towards uh, the Virginia Beach area from where I was. And um, so what was this other object that you saw? Now, to me, this looked uh, very different. Hold on a second. I think I'm... Drones was that you do see these intermittent flashing lights, but they're not lights that are consistent with the kind of lights you'd see that are frequently following an exact pattern, a frequency. Right. And again, it's because if these are enemy drones, even if they're experimental drones, they're not going to put, I don't think they're going to put FAA regulation lights on these things. They're going to look, they're going to put on lights that don't match what the FAA requires to make it look weird on purpose. We've discussed that so many times as well. These things are made to look weird on purpose. So if the lights don't match, okay. But since when do non-human, like, since when do they flash? <laughs> like, since when? On a drone or on a helicopter. And here's the thing, too. Like, if it is an enemy drone, let's just say for a second it is. If the thing is completely dark... And that enemy drone goes and um, into a turbine of a military craft or runs into a helicopter and crack and, and, cr and creates a situation in which people die. The international upheaval that would come out of that would well i mean just look at what's going on in israel and iran right now like if that was a chinese drone that got sucked into the intake of an f-16 that f-16 then crashed into a house near langley and exploded and it killed civilians and then when the forensics teams go in there and start figuring out what's what happened and they find out that it was a chinese drone that got sucked into the intake because they were spying on us over our most sensitive airspace yeah i can kind of understand why they're putting lights on it to avoid that they don't want that they want to spy but they don't want to cause a a, a situation in which world war three can spawn So I can kind of understand why they want them to be seen. Makes sense. I don't know. Is that crazy? Because it seems like every time these things, especially like when I think of the triangle pyramids, 
that Jeremy Corbell says they're pyramids. They're not. They're not pyramids. But how they lit up. They're not, they're not being shy about this. Like, oh, we're here. And we'll send 40 of these things to shut down the military base so we can spy on it. Like, that's how, that's how bold they're getting. Or it could be a Lockheed Martin testing their new toys against our best hardware to show potential buyers, hey, look how close we can get to Langley. You sure you don't want to order a couple hundred of these? They're ready to go. All right, we'll take an order. We'll take a few. I, it, it could be both of those things. <laughs> One of those things. Combination. I mean, when somebody does get hurt, and like I said before, it's coming. Something with a drone, it's coming. <laughs> it's it is coming, dude. I mean, when you've got Langley getting shut down by 40 drones, it's coming. Helicopter or on an aircraft. Correct. Yes. They did not, in my opinion, did not appear to be like FAA regulated blinking lights on, on planes and, uh, with, with, that are on the ends of wings. They, they seem to, to move uniformly. Uh, one yeah, they're moving in a straight line and going as fast as a plane. There's nothing anomalous about these. One of my videos, you can see where two of the orbs kind of pull apart in distance and one's beating an almost like triplet and one's beating in more of a heartbeat path, a heartbeat uh, type rhythm. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it was very, very unusual. I think you also mentioned in your earlier conversation with me off camera that there was another type of object that you saw that night. I don't want to lead you, so tell me oh, what else you saw. Oh, don't want to lead him. What'd you see? Yes, uh, so I probably saw about 40 of the smaller drones that were at a higher elevation. 40? That would, uh, I, would, I would say so, yes. Uh, 40 total drones. Now. So, so let's, let's not use the drone word, because that's a very loaded word. <laughs> you, you, you saw 40 orb-type objects. What color were they? Uh, they would go from the reddish orange to white light, uh, uh, changing from one shade of that light, the reddish orange to white, and getting back and forth. Wow! Um, so, th so this isn't this isn't like a. I mean, I, I noticed the war zone used the terminology drone. Th this isn't something that's consistent with something that's the size of a even a commercial drone. A commercial drone is possibly what a meter across. You're describing yes. something that's the size of a car. It's changing color, and the Again, flash. He's a. He's a. God, we, damn it! Uh, damn it! High confidence. I keep in... doing that. He's Boy, not. Look. He's assuming the size of this thing. It's ten miles away. He's assuming that it's the size of a car. Prop might be. Maybe he's right. But I, how does he confirm that? It's coming from that object no they it would seem to get seem to come in own word because that's a very loaded word <laughs> you, you you saw 40 orb type objects what color were they uh they would go from the reddish orange to white light again uh, uh changing from one shade of that light the reddish orange to white and getting back and forth wow um, so th so this isn't this isn't like a I mean, I, I noticed the war zone used the terminology drone. Th this isn't something that's consistent with something that's the size of a even a commercial drone. A commercial drone is possibly, what, a meter across. You're describing yes. something that's the size of a car. It's changing color, and the flashing lights on it are changing color and varying intermittently. Yes, yes. And then they would follow the exact path around and then back over. Yeah, you could tell that they've had this conversation before and that this conversation, like Ross said at the beginning, is, oh, surprise, surprise. We just got confirmation that this guy's going to talk to us. Like he's leading these questions. He's already had this conversation with this guy before. You could tell. You could tell. Over uh, Langley and sometimes stopping to hover over the base 
before they would go back out at that southeasterly direction they came from, like towards uh, the Virginia Beach area from where I was. And so what was this other object that you saw? Here now, we go. To me, this looked uh, very different. It would come from the same direction as the, uh, I will say smaller, but the car size. Or I bet they all came from the ocean. He doesn't tell you what direction they came in from, but I bet you a million dollars they came from the ocean. <laughs> I, I put the house on it, man. Steve Long says, not to mention that one, he doesn't know how large the object is, and two, he's guesstimating the distance at 10 miles. The objects could be much smaller and closer than he's speculating. You're right. They could be much closer than what he thinks. Um, because, yeah, if they're, if, if they're 10 miles away and it's this dark, I just don't understand how he can get a reference on the size of those things. Um, orbs. And this... It would come down over and the again, northern Look how this thing's bank moving. It's completely so parallel. It's probably closer to it four looks, miles. It flies uh, like a plane. It flies like a plane. D directly past me, it moved uh, right westward on, on the river past Fort Eustace. And this west on the river. So it was going west. This looked... The bottom was a glowing orangish red, uh, kind of uh, lens shaped, uh, semicircular, uh, and it appeared to have three white lights uh, at the, the top of it. Uh, and, and it moved probably slightly above the tree level. Uh, was very slightly slow. above the tree level. <laughs> no, I don't think so, buddy. That's pretty high. That's way above tree level there. Right in front of me. Uh, and it went past three times. So this was either three separate vehicles or the same vehicle or, or uh, craft uh, going, circling around three times. Uh, and in my opinion, it kind of looked like it was monitoring or, or observing everything that was going on mm. over Langley. So you seem to be describing a mothership. Uh, don't want to lead you on, but it sounds like you're describing a ship so big that a building needs to be constructed around it. Is that what you're saying, Jonathan Butner? No. Okay. Yes, that's that's. A, I'm, I would say that a command command control is something that came to mind while did, I watched did, it. Did you see any of the objects coming from that object? No, they it would seem to, it seemed to come in separately uh, uh, and run that different course than the orbs that were coming in and, and running uh, their their pattern. Uh, and how long and, did you see these objects for overall? And what time of night was this, John? How much you want to bet? Well, this guy is one of the forty witnesses. I throw it. I bet he's one of the witnesses. Uh, the first one I saw was probably right at seven fifteen. Uh, it peaked, I would say, around 8 p.m. that, that evening. And then. So 45 like minutes. So do you have 45 minutes worth of footage? And in the 45 minutes, you didn't call anybody and say, yo, get, get your camera. Look at this shit. It began, it, it trickled down to a slow line. And the last one I saw was probably right before 9 p.m., which is when I went inside. Now, as you I understand, you just went inside, getting invaded by what you think is a mothership, and you're like, "Yeah, all right. I'm going to go inside now." <laughs> Come on, man. Friend Ryan Graves, who I'm also interviewing for this program, he's helped you get onto the FBI, who are investigating this case. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I have spoken with them as well. To Okay, yeah, the FBI is going to want to talk to somebody who filmed adversarial drones over Langley Air Force Base and collect all the footage and all the information that they could possibly share. Yep, sure are. But I promise you, the FBI is not going to come back and say, yeah, this guy saw a mothership. Detailing what I saw.
And was their interest piqued by the fact that you clearly are not describing what I think anyone would describe as a commercial or known military drone? Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to speak for them, but I, they did. Uh, they were interested, and I'm, I, I'm, I was glad to be able to discuss with them, uh, you know, what what I saw, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to do, you know, their due diligence with that. Sure. So, have you been approached at all by anybody from the Defense Department, the U.S. Air Force, or perhaps even from ARO, the uh, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office? Uh, no, sir. Not at this time. No, would, would you be prepared to speak to them and give evidence to them if you were asked? Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm willing to tell my story and uh, and and help in any way I can with any kind of investigation. So, John, can I say this? I, I actually think I speak for a lot of people when I say mm. it's very easy to get stigmatized and ridiculed for coming forward with sightings of UAPs. Mm. I just want to put it on the record. Well done to you for being well willing to come to forward, you. for having the courage to speak publicly, uh, and, and well done to you also for speaking to the authorities. I'd say well done for just, yeah, having your hand on the swivel and actually getting footage of us getting basically attacked by another country. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being for paying attention. Absolutely. Can't 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 disagree there. Thank you. I greatly appreciate that. And I want to say it's, it's been watching people like you and uh, Ryan Graves. Uh, oh, watching people like you and Ryan Graves. Oh. Oh, is that is that a confirmation bias I hear leaking in there? You're you're a fan of Ross Coulthart and Ryan Graves, and watching what they're doing. Go on. Uh, and others who have spoken out. It's really been a others who've voice. spoken out. Like who? Dave Grutch, maybe. Blue Elizondo. Hmm. Who else? Hmm. on this. No, thank you. And I, I, I really appreciate that because we're in this Yeah, because God knows Ross loves having his ass kissed. Weird situation at the moment where particularly the US Air Force is very reluctant to make any kind of admissions about UAPs. We've had that, I think, very silly UAP historical report that was done by Arrow just in the last few weeks, which discounted the possibility that this is anything anomalous. Let me ask you this way. Do you think it's more likely than not that the objects you saw that December night last year... Don't want to lead you. Don't want to lead them, do we, Ross? ...were still an open mystery, anomalous, or do you think they are plausibly explainable as some kind of drone technology? Uh, I, in my... My opinion is that I believe they are anomalous and that they do, do mm. um, deserve to have a thorough yeah. investigation and to find out what, what they are and where, where they're coming from. Which all begs the question, why 